Hello, hello everyone. How's your week so far? How's your week so far? Good? Great, great. Um, I heard that um, week six or week seven um, can be a pretty busy week for some of you. Um, but congratulations for coming here, making it in person, coming to this lecture. Um, can anyone online let me know if you can hear me or now? Okay. Sure. So um, what okay. we'll be talking about today, uh, we have so, um, two very exciting topics today. Uh, one is conceptual modeling and the other one is deployment. Okay. So we'll first talk about conceptual modeling. Um, again, we will be talking about why, and then we will talk about uh, more details like how. Okay, so why do we need conceptual modeling? So let's consider a scenario like um, one: you have a set of so you have already have a software that is working, um, but you think, well, that may be something that is missing, like from my software, or I think there's something is not working well but I'm not sure why, like what is missing? Uh, why um, my users are not very happy with my software? Okay, so what shall we do? Imagine you are the owner of that software, okay, and you want to make some improvement to it, but you do not know how. Um, how do you start with that? Any thoughts? Shall we look into the code directly? Perhaps, maybe there's some bugs. <laughs> but um, um, pretty often like there may be some other um, more high level issues. Like maybe there are some um, situations that you didn't consider before. Like there may be some other use cases you didn't consider. Um, so it might be pretty hard if you look into the code directly because there are many, many lines, many, many files in it, it's really hard to read and find like, what is really missing um, from a high level of view. Um, so this is the first scenario. Um, another scenario is that um, you want to start with from scratch, like you want to have a new software. Like for example, you want to have a software that can help you um, have a timetable, like list all your assignments due days, all your lecture days, locations, and everything. Um, do you start to write your code directly? No? Yeah, um, I agree. Like, we, we don't start with writing the code directly. We need to have some kind of high level like overview of your software. Like, what should be in there? Um, and how the different components of different um, entities like interact with each other. Okay, so this kind of high level of view. So this is why we need to have something called um, conceptual modeling. It's kind of provide with us a high level um, overview of things, of our software. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's go back, have a look at like what is model? What is a model in general? Um, can you think of anything that is a model? Like, let me give you some examples first. Okay, so this is the model, right? And uh, this is a mathematical model, right? And we also may have, oh, this is also a model, <laughs> right? Um, what else? This is also a model. It's not detailed, like how we implement, there's no such details, but very high level. Um, again, this one, and also um, chemical model. Yeah, but it's also not real, right? It's a model. This is also a model like how users interact with different parts and different components interact with each other. Um, do you have any other examples? Like, what, what do you think of? Like, perhaps can be a model. Yes, yes, that's really what I'm thinking too. So, um, repeat for those online. So, what we mentioned is that well, before we start building a building, like we need to have a model of it. 
right? So we may use some papers or some, um, should have an artifact of it. So it's called a physical model, so that part. And also other examples we have shown here, um, these are also physical model. And also uh, when we put a new car into, uh, like into real, like building new cars, we also have models, right? So before we um, go to the details. Okay, so this is a model. So a model is a simplified representation to assist in understanding something more complex. So it's a definition, perhaps. And this covers everything from mathematics through to model aeroplanes. And conceptual model is a type of model that captures a system in a conceptual way rather than in a physical way. So this is uh, we said what we said like before we have uh, we build a building like we may have a physical model using some artifacts. But uh, here what we are talking about is more about like conceptual modeling. Um, most in most cases it may be like um, drawing on a paper or have some visually uh, models. Okay. Um, yeah, so here are more examples of conceptual modeling. Um, the first one we have seen here is mathematical model, like as we have seen in that uh, example. And we also have um, data models, like how we model of a database. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples here. So for example, uh, we may model of a database. So there are also many, many different types of data models again. So for example, we have relational model that you will learn in 3311, okay? And there are also other types of database model, for example, the object-oriented database model and um, others. So this is how a database model, oh, white again. I will make it black. Okay, should be better, right? So this is a database model, okay? We also may have like hierarchical, uh, hierarchical model. Like um, for example, here we have grid apps and different types of it. So this is also a kind of data modeling, uh, how we model database, okay? And we may also have like domain models. There are also courses in, um, future like following years that we will learn about more about domain models. And now today we will mainly be talking about state transition models. Um, let's also have a look at some examples. So for example here, this is, all, uh, this is an example of a state transition model. Uh, we'll have more detailed look at it, but just have a idea of how it looks like. So what a state transition model or state diagram looks like is that uh, have some states here. For example, the state accepted, state of uh, placed, or state of fulfilled, it's really describing the states. Okay, so this is an example. Um, okay, so let's go back here. Okay. So there are many, many different type of uh, conceptual modeling. And if you search online for conceptual model, you see more, much more examples. Like you can model nearly everything with conceptual modeling. Right. Um, but in software engineering, uh, when we talk about conceptual modeling, mainly we are talking about two types of conceptual modeling, uh, which include constructural and behavioral conceptual modeling. Okay, um, the main difference that for structural uh, conceptual modeling, we are modeling some static um, structure of the system. For example, what is in the system? Like what are the data entities in the system? For example, uh, DML class diagram. So what are the entity classes there? And we may also have ER diagrams, like how we are uh, modeling our database. So what are the entities in it? and what is the relationship between those entities. 
So it's more about like a uh, static structure of the system. Like this is the structural uh, conceptual modeling. Um, in other cases, we also have behavioral constructual modeling. So this is the other way like of modeling. It's modeling the dynamic behavior. I mean that for example we have uh, we have seen here is a slide. Okay, so this is the current state of it of this UI. If I click on this button, it changed. Right, so it's modeling the behavioral part of uh, your system, like emphasize the dynamic, dynamic behavior. So examples include the state uh, diagrams, okay, so how we model the state machines. Um, we will also talk about use case diagram next week. We will uh, spend some time talking about use case diagram, and we will uh, dig deep into uh, state diagram today. This, this is a pretty um, useful and um, interesting part of modeling. Um, yeah, so what are models used for? Right. So we, we talk about uh, at the beginning like two scenarios, like when you want to improve your software or you want to have a uh, new software. So these are two examples like what are those models used for? So for the first one, like we can see here, to predict future states of affairs. So meaning that you have a model, have, for example, in the state uh, diagram, um, you put in your model all potential states there. Uh, so it's kind of it's less surprise there. So everything you have put it down in your model, like what can be happen, what can happen uh, in your software, like what are the states. And also for the database um, modeling, when we model database, we also put all the entities and all the relationships there. So we, we kind of have less surprise because everything is already in that model, like what can be happen in your software. But if there's something that is not in your model and happens that surprises you, you need to put it in your model, <laughs> meaning that you might have missed something in your model. Okay, so this is what are the first thing, like to predict future states of affairs. Um, for example, here uh, we have two buttons here, either left or right. Okay, so I can know that if I click on it, it will jump to the previous slide. If I click on the next one, it will jump to the next slide. And um, the second one here is understand the current state of affairs. So what is the current state and what it can, um, like, what, what from this current state, what are the next steps I can jump to and what are the previous steps I can go back to. Okay. And to convey the fundamental principles and the basic functionality of system to help with communication. So this is very important. Okay. So um, for example, if you are working as a consultant, like software consultant, and a customer, a client, Come to, comes to you and say, well, I have a software and I want to improve it. And what that client gives you is a long list of requirements, like using natural language, like for example, uh, he put in the list, like requirement one, okay, I want my software to be able to accept user inputs. And the user input types to be A, B, C, D, and E. And requirement number two is uh, from a user input, I can do blah, blah, blah. So if a client gives you something like that, a long list of requirements, it's really hard to find what, it, what are the potential problems of that, like what I can improve. It's really hard to understand. It's not easy for communication. However, if you have like a conceptual model, it's much easier to understand. Like kind of give you an overview, a top level overview of um, how the system works and what is in that system. Okay, so this is very important, like it helps with communication. Um, and there are four fundamental objectives of communicating with a conceptual model. Uh, most of this we have already covered. So for example, the first one, enhance an individual's understanding of the representative system. So it helps you understand your system, and it facilit facilitates efficient conveyance of system details between stakeholders. So stakeholders here maybe include uh, the developers, 
Okay, and you may also have an operation team in your company. It also helps with uh, communication be between different teams. They may also have uh, UI, UX team, right? So they may have different stakeholders. You may also have uh, your users. So it's help with uh, communication system details between stakeholders. And it also provides a point of reference for system designers to extract system specifications. So if, for example, you um, are a system designer, okay, uh, and if you are given a long list of requirements, as we have seen the example, it's really hard, right? And the last one is document the system for future reference and provide a means for collaboration. Okay, so now let's have a look at this specific type of conceptual modeling, which is called state diagrams. Um, state diagrams uh, models states. Right, so what is state? State is the current state. <laughs> so, um, so let's have a look at this example and we'll explain. Like, um, in this state diagram, we have two states here, uh, which include closed and open. So for example, you have a door. And the door can be either closed or opened. Okay, so these are the two states. And the state can transit from each other. The arrows here um, meaning the transitions. And there needs to be some event or actions that trigger that transition, which are here like open or close. Okay, so this is um, the main components of state diagram. There are three parts. So the first part is the state. And um, sometimes we model state as circles, as what we have seen here. Um, but in other uh, scenarios, we may also model it in uh, rectangle. So both are fine, as long as you are uh, being consistent. So if you model state as a rectangle, uh, you model it as a rectangle everywhere. Okay, so, um, but there are also some, um, okay, we will talk about that later. And the second part of a state diagram is the transitions. So the arrows, okay, meaning the uh, transitions. And we also have open and close here, which is the third component, uh, meaning the event or triggers. Okay. Um, so state diagrams, it is very powerful in showing the various states um, a system could be in and how it can change states. Uh, from uh, one state to the other. It's a powerful technique for uh, analysis, design, and also testing sometimes. Okay. And um, when we want to draw state diagrams, um, we can draw on the paper, of course, and there are also like you can draw on a draw pad. And, there's also a tool called Lucid Chart. Uh, I'm not sure if you have used that before, um, but it's helpful. Uh, so it looks like this. So Lucid Chart, um, it provides some templates. It's pretty useful. Um, let's use this current template here. So I click on this button, use this template. Uh, with Lucy App, you can also quite easy to collaborate with your teammates. So you can collaborate on. So this is how it looks like. I will change the style to make sure it's easier for you. Um, this one. Okay, so it's easier. Now we have some states here, and we also have some arrows to model the transitions and some actions or triggers here. Okay. So um, state diagrams are actually be used uh, used to uh, describe state machines. Uh, any idea? Like, what do you think is a state machine? Any guess?
Have you heard of this term before? No. Okay. So, um, state machine is a behavioral model. Um, it consists of finite number of states. So it's not infinite, it's finite number of states. And it's therefore also called finite state machine. So finite state machine and state machine are the same. So based on the current state and a given input, the machine performs state transition and produces output. So this is what a state machine is. And our software are actually, is actually a state machine. It has finite a number of states and it can transit from one state to the other. And the basic building blocks of a state machine are the states and the transactions. Right, so we can model the state machine with state diagrams, looks like this. And our software is uh, a type of uh, one kind of state machine. So how, um, so let's have a look at some more examples. The UIs with different screens, like we have seen here and here, so different states here, and also network protocols and conversational interfaces. So how do we draw a state diagram? So how can we start with? So let's have a look at this example first, and then we'll draw our own together later. So here's an example of parking meter. So for example, you um, park, your, uh, park your car and you uh, go to the parking meter and want to pay for it. So the first thing like you will see on that parking meter is enter the parking bay, like which bay are you, uh, have you parked. Right, so this is the first state, like we start with. Okay, and then um, there's only uh, transition from this enter parking bay, which is we put in which bay we have parked. So we put in a bay and the, it may show in another state like error duration. What is error duration? Our oh, enter duration. So how long you want to park, right? Uh, this is the second state. And you can cancel it here. So you can cancel and it will go back to the uh, starting state. And you, if you put in the enter, enter, like how long you want to park, okay, and then it will ask you to put in your money. So the next state is insert coins. It will ask you to insert coins. And if you insert coins, if it's not enough, you insert coins again and again till it's enough. And if it's sufficient prompt, you can confirm now. Okay, so before you really confirm, you can also cancel it or you just finish your confirmation and it's done and ready for the next one to put in, uh, to get ready. Uh, so the parking meter will be get ready for the next person to come in. So this is kind of um, an example with parking meter. Um, in this insert coin, we may also have coins ejected. So before we put in sufficient fund, we want to cancel it, perhaps. Like we just do not want to park here. So it's kind of modeling the parking meter. Um, so it's quite useful for us to understand an overview of the software that we want to implement. Um, but you may also notice that there might be something that you want to improve. Or you might notice that there's something perhaps is not correct. Okay, so let's have a look at this example. Is there anything you want to change? Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we are saying here is that give me some change. So if I give them $5, but actually what is really needed is $3, I need to get some change. Yes, that's a good point. Right. Anything else? So what if um, I stop at a parking meter and I put in like how long I want to park here and then I left. I didn't proceed, I just left. Right, so first we also need to have something here. Uh, I didn't um, click on the cancel button, but I just left. So perhaps we also need here like after one minute also it will cancel and go back to the initial state here. And the same will might be um, insert coins. 
I insert only one cent and then I left. I found that I do not have enough money and um, I may cancel it and the coins get ejected. But um, if I forgot or something, it may be like cancelled automatically. Okay. So there may be other triggers. So uh, having this kind of model is really easy for us to identify what we really need in our software. So this is the example here. Right, so in this, you can say like five minutes later, and we also have five minutes later, kind of cancel it. Um, yeah, so this is this example. Um, we have another quick activity here, um, which asks us to model OPPO card system. Um, I would say instead, let's do something more fun. <laughs> so, what it, uh, let's skip this activity and do another one. Okay, so what if um, we want to design a software for um, shopping online? Okay, so here yeah, uh, I will delete all this and let's start together. Like how we model it. Okay. So what I put here first is uh, item is available. Okay, so let's track the uh, states of an item from it's available. The noise. Okay, so what, uh, what can be other states of that item? Yep. Soda. Yep. Soda. What else? The state of an item in an online store. So you're thinking from a consumer's point of view. Um, it might be purchased. Right, the state from the consumer's point of view, the state is purchased. What else? Like when you are shopping online. Did you ever put your item in like in the trunk? Yes. How to spell it? <laughs> Hard? No. Okay, what else? Um, did you press the like the button and uh, put in a folder called my favorite items? Save for later. Save for later. Is there anything else? Um, Let's just have this state at this moment. Okay, so let, let me have a look if there's any idea from online. Okay, so let's start to draw the transitions. So starting from available, um, I may want to save it for, save the full later. It's a state, it's a save the full later. Okay. Um, so the action or the trigger here is I save it. <laughs> I put it in the favorite. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Uh, save it. Um, I may also have another action like I put in the put in my Okay, I make it bigger here. So this is how we actually draw uh, state diagrams. We put the state potential state there, and we draw the transitions and put uh, action all the triggers in the uh, for those transitions. Okay. So I save it, uh, save for later, and after I save it, I can also purchase it. Right. 
Uh, after it's in the chart, I can also purchase. Same for later, it needs to be in the chart first. Is it chart? No H. Oh, yes, thanks. Um, after I save it for later for a while, but I didn't pay, it might be sold out. Um, I may also put in the card and I didn't pay for a while, Oops. and uh, it will sold out. Okay, maybe I can put it here like after a few days. Right, so this is how we draw state diagrams. And then you can have a double check it or you can send it to your friends and to other stakeholders for feedback before you really implement your software. Otherwise, if you start implementing your software too early, like before you get feedback from other stakeholders and you figure out something is wrong, it's really um, costly, like time consuming to write the code again. So this is the process of it. Okay, let's skip this part. Okay, so great. So um, talking about um, conceptual modeling, there are some um, languages that we can use for uh, modeling that all the people can understand. So there are some standard way of communication um, the models. So one popular one is called UML. Okay, so let's have a look. So this is one of the popular um, modeling language. It's called UML. How can I convert the color? Revert the color. Okay. Right. With uh, UML, you can model not only the state diagram. There are many other types of uh, modeling uh, sub are also supported by UML. So for example, uh, the class state diagram okay, that for object-oriented languages, um, it also supports it. And it supports not only behavioral conceptual modeling, but also structural. Uh, conceptual modeling. So there are some standard language like how you model uh, different type of uh, conceptual models. Okay, so in UML um, for static modeling, the states are not uh, circles, it's rectangles. But it's r absolutely fine if you use circles instead of rectangles in your state diagrams, as long as you are being consistent. But there's um, the UML is a standard way of uh, more standard language. So you can find more details here. So this link is UML dash diagram. But you can also find many web pages talking about uh, Unified uh, modeling language. And also the Lucy chart that we just seen here, it also supports UML. Okay. Um, what else I'm missing? Okay. So that is really everything about conceptual modeling. Um, it's very important. Right? Um, it's not that detailed like how we code each line of our code, but it gives us a top level overview of your system. Uh, it's used for before you start with, uh, start building your software from scratch. It's also useful in the middle, like when you want to improve something, you want to change something. Right? So it's, it replaced the traditional way of writing a long list of requirements. So it's a, a step beyond writing um, the requirements using natural languages. Okay, um, okay, cool. Now let's, shall we move on to the next topic now or should we have a quick break and move on to deployment? Are you tired? Need a break or we can continue? 
What about we continue with deployment and when you are tired and when you want a break, let me know and we can have that break. Okay, cool. Um, great, so I will report this color again. So deployment, very exciting, right? Um, it's a very, very exciting topic. Like, the deployment, you must have heard of this word. Like in lab five, um, you might have already had a look at deployment. Um, oops. What is it? <laughs> All right. Uh, what is this noise? Hmm? Who's running? Oh, gone. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Oops. I might need to stand here. <laughs> okay, so deployment is actually making our, self, our software available online for other people to use. Right, so um, maybe you already have a very great software locally that you can play with it. Um, but it's, as long as it's not available for other users to use, um, it's not enough, it's not finished, it's not done yet. So uh, eventually we need to have our software available for other people to use, right? So this is deployment. So in very, very simple word, like deployment means um, make your software available for everyone to use. Okay, so this is deployment. Right, so we have it here also. Like activities relating to make a software system available to use. That's it. Okay, um, let's have some fun. Like very, very basic deployment and all of you can do it right now. <laughs> so as a CSE student, we all have a website like you can use. And so if you want to have some fun with it, um, so we can deploy to our CSE account. Uh, we have a public HTML folder uh, in CSE. So let's have a quick look. Um, so here's my terminal. I log on to my CSE server. Okay, so now I'm on my CSE server now. Um, you will see that there's a folder called public that uh, HTML. All of you have that folder in your CSE account. Sorry about the noise. What is it? Okay, sure. Um, let's go to this public. Now I'm in this folder, um, there's two files in it, which is index.html uh, and test.txt. I just randomly put two files there. So you can always uh, have an index.html in that folder. Let's have a look at what's in uh, my index.html file. So this is everything in it. I only have a hello world here. So you can have fun, have some fun with it. Um, okay. So before I um, put it, sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry about the noise. Um, what I can do? Okay. Can you hear me from the back? <laughs> okay. Cool. Great. Um, so um, before. I make it available for all of you to really look at my index.html file online. I need to um, change it to make it public available to view, uh, which is com uh, 744 HTML. Oh, I forgot. Com index. 
sorry, a typo here. It should be C-H-M-O-D. Oops, typo again. Okay, so now when I open a web browser and I put in the web browser here, um, it's cgi.cse.unsw.edu.au and dash my ZID. I will show in here, hello world. Yep, question. Uh -huh. Yes, you can have a try right now. <laughs> you can access my hello world. Yes, it's hosted here at CSE. So all of you can have uh, your personal website here at CSE. Yes, yes, it's, um, it will be cgi.cse.unsw.edu and you, your ZID will be followed here. Okay. Um, if you want to look into more details and you want to do it uh, at home, uh, CSE also have a very detailed guideline here. So you can have a look at here. So we have more details like how we can deploy our website, uh, host our website at CSE server. So you can have a look at the more. It's very, very straightforward. Just find that uh, public HTML folder and put your index HTML file there and put anything, everything that you want in that index uh, .html file. And it will automatically alive here. You can have a self-introduction uh, self online, perhaps. Yep, so this is deployment, right? So it's not as complex as we might thought. It's pretty straightforward somehow, okay? Um, however, in like before days, like deployment is not that easy. Um, now we have cloud, like cloud server like AWS and others. Um, but before the deployment was l much less frequent and much more physical. So remembering the days we use CDs. Like we buy a CD and install a software locally. <laughs> Did you? Never? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like when I was a kid, my, my dad played some games. Like he bought those CDs and installed it uh, in the computer. But nowadays, we, we can, like, for example, we can just open a web browser and uh, we use our emails or everything. We do not need to install it locally, right? But we can just uh, access our inbox, like our mailbox online directly, right? So deployment before was pretty hard, but something has changed. Um, we have a lot of web-based apps, like we do not need to install, like uh, as a, like the mailbox, right? We, we can access it in every computer, we put in the browser, like login to Google email, and we can access our uh, mailbox. Okay, we do not need to. We do not need to uh, install it. And we also have improvement to our internet connectivity speed, and that way, so deployment now is very different from before. Um, and these changes have a lot for uh, the pushing of updated software to users, much more frequent. Um, yeah, like how Facebook is updated. And the example that is very, very popular is the Netflix one. Like Netflix uh, made a lot of deployments each day, like 10 deployments each day. Right, roughly, is that right? Um, many or more um, deployments each day. So it's a lot easier nowadays. Like um, a movement from software as an asset to software as a service. So software as an asset is like before we buy a software and we install it on our computer. And software as a service is the example, like we access our uh, mailbox online and Netflix Netflix is also an example of uh, software as a service. 
So we do not need to have uh, everything locally. Like we do not um, store all of our emails in our laptop, but everything is stored uh, on the server that provided by the service, like provided by Microsoft, provided by Google. So we do not have a uh, we do not need to have everything locally. So it's more like a software as a service. So there are also uh, other examples. Um, for example, we can use uh, a lot of service from Microsoft, right, like Teams. Um, and OneNote, how many of you have used OneNote, right? It's also available online. The files is not stored uh, locally. And they also help us, like securing, uh, helping us with the security. Uh, they do everything for us, and everything is on their server. It's not locally. So this is uh, software as a service, and we pay uh, the subscription fee sometimes. For example, for the Netflix, right? We didn't buy it, but we subscribe it and pay the subscription fee. So more example like Microsoft. Um, yeah, so with those cloud services, it's much easier nowadays to deploy our web applications. Um, those are pretty powerful uh, tools. For example, the uh, AWS and the one from Google uh, as well. Um, and AWS offers some free plans that, and they also have a lot of documents on how you can deploy your software on AWS. So if you are interested, you can always uh, have a go, like have a try. Um, you can use it for free for a while. Um, yeah, and also for those kind of cloud services, they provide, um, they help you with security. They do a lot of things for you. You can also, if you have a lot of files, like JSON file, or YAML file you can also store on their cloud. Okay, so it really helps with uh, deployment um, to speed up. Okay, so um, before we move on, um, I think it's time to have a break <laughs> because we are jumping to another uh, part of this deployment. Okay, otherwise, yeah, okay, 10 minutes break and we will come back at three, okay? Like Maybe it's trying to when it gets close to the sun. Oh right. yes, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a plug here. Oops, okay. Yeah. Perhaps somewhere it's not connected well. Yeah, it's like loose wires, I think. Yes. It's probably loose wires if you connect that to yourself. Mm. Over there, so. It's this wire. I reckon. Mm. Cheap, cheap wires. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, probably better this. Better not touch. This one, if you move that one too much, I think it. Uh. I think that's where the noise comes from. Um. I think that's why it's got the tape there. Oh. It's something to be bended or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. just do cheap not touch <laughs> it. Just leave it here. Oh, carefully. Right 
So you're like a nigga of damage wire. Yeah, so yeah. it's straight, yeah, it's fine. But when it goes sideways, it's... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you.
let's start again okay um yep before we move on let's have a little more fun with the uh, personal web page on csc server um, so if you want to know more so here's the website like from computer science engineering or cic taiji um, and the url of your website will be uh, either these two they will be the same Okay, so either it would be uh, cse.unsw.edu.ao slash tilde zid or you can have your zid first and dot web cse.unsw.edu.au and um, the, I just want to uh, mention again like where you need to store that index.html file so it's in, you can use vlab okay, um, I do not have, I also have I think I have VLAB here. So you can also log into your VLAB or you can use a terminal to log into your CSC server. And then you can find this uh, public HTML folder uh, in there. And you can just put an index.html file. Uh, and you can open it and edit it. It can also be PHP file or Python or whatever, it doesn't matter. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. So you can call other pages from index.html. Yeah, um, I used to, to use CSC server to host a web page for my research project. Um, it's quite large, I would say, like have a lot of email, oh, sorry, images, uh, also have like users interacting with it, like putting forms and other stuff. So yeah, CSC server do a lot of that. It does a lot of that. Okay, so let's have some uh, my index.html. So this is what I have here. So I can also add it so you can see that um, it can change. Welcome, uh, hello world, com 1531. Okay, and I, sorry, I only have one hand now. Um, and I also need to make sure uh, the permission is properly. So I need to comp um, either seven double four or seven double five. I tried both and both worked. Um, and then I can find this and refresh it. Hello world comp one five three one. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is how it works. Um, yeah, now we can move on. Um, a quick recap of uh, continuous integration. So you might have already done a lot of practices on continuous integration so far, right? So continuous integration is the practice of automating the integration of code changes from multiple contributors into a single software project. So it's a very good uh, software practice that you merge code um, frequently and quickly so that you can identify uh, if there's any errors, if there's anything wrong before you make too many changes. Uh, so this is uh, continuous integration. Um, in addition to continuous integration, like we already have seen it on GitLab that is CI slash CD. Right? Have you ever wondered what is that CD? What do you think is that CD mean? What does CD mean? Continuous deployment or develop? Any other thoughts? <laughs> Good guess though. Yeah. Continuous delivery? Yeah. Cool. So it means either continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Okay, so we'll be talking about those two. Um, so continuous integration is great. It helps us to uh, integrate our code uh, frequently and automatically uh, test if there's a, whether there's a green tick there, right? So it's already great, but we also need something 
we might need something more, like in addition to it. Um, so we also want to achieve rapid deployment circles. Right, so we not only want to merge quickly, we also want to deploy quickly and frequently. And so this is why we have CD. Um, so modern deployment isn't as simple as pushing the code, but uh, rather like a heavily integrated and automated approach is preferred. Like this is the same with testing, like testing is good, like jazz testing is good, but we do not want to manually do it a lot, we want to automate this process, right? Um, and this new part of the pipeline we'll explore is called continuous de uh, delivery okay, or continuous deployment. Um, continuous delivery means that um, it allows accepted code changes to be deployed to customers quickly and sustainably. Okay, so not only we integrate code, but if that green tick is there, uh, we also want to deploy it automatically. But not fully automatically, but we still need to push a button uh, to make sure that it's delivered, uh, deployed. Um, so this is the button push. It's not fully automatically, but it's already uh, simplified the process. Okay. So this involves the automation of the release process such that release can be done in only a button push. Okay. And um, some companies, they have like the daily deployment or weekly deployment or two days before. So they may have a regular deployment, for example, after two days and everything looks like good, I click on that button and release to the customers. Right, we deploy it. Um, so this ship code process, sometimes we also call it the sign off process. Um, with some human intervention, which is click on that button to, de to deploy that code. So this is called continuous delivery. Um, And for the release, um, sometimes like when we have uh, continuous integration on, continuous delivery on, but before we click on that uh, button, we try to use it uh, within a group of people. So for example, you have your project group, right? So after everything looks fine, like pass all the tests, you also want to really use it like before really release to that customer because some error or something that may be wrong cannot be caught by um, our tests. So only when we are really using it, like we can, we may figure out like, well, there's something that I want to change. Maybe something is wrong. So this is the process. Um, yeah, so this is, um, so here in this example, we have three core tiers, but it really depends. You may have less, but you may have more. So this is the process from your code tested well to uh, your customers real, uh, your customers get access to your new software. Uh, and the first part, the first tier here in this example um, is we release often, available to developers to see their changes in deployment. But we also want to have some uh, users to test before release to broader group of users. Right. And the final stage, the final tag here is release to other uh, customers. And the goal, the aim here is always as quickly as possible. So um, the idea that the reason that we want to release as uh, quickly as possible is that it's similar to uh, our CI. Like we want to merge code in CI, we merge code quickly and often. For deployment, it's the same. We also want to deploy quickly and often. And if there's an error, like we do not uh, accumulate a lot of errors and then we try to solve them, so then it will be very hard to solve. So the idea behind it is that we want to release, uh, deploy it often and if there's anything wrong, that we can patch it and we can solve it. 
So it's very different from traditional way of software development. So in traditional software development, we may make a lot of change in one time, like, and then we uh, deploy it after like a month, even a year or multiple years. Uh, but here, like in more modern uh, software development, we want to deploy it quickly. And if there's an error, we caught it quickly as well, and then we solve it. Okay. Um, now we have talked about continuous delivery. Um, the other part of CD is continuous deployment. So what is the difference? So both of them um, is um, both of them aim to deploy automatically and quickly. So what's the difference between continuous deployment and continuous uh, delivery? So the only difference is that in continuous delivery, we have that button that we need to click on it to make sure it's deployed. But in continuous deployment, there's no such button. Everything is automatic. Okay, so this is the only difference. So um, different companies, different um, groups may choose different strategies. Some maybe want to save, be safe, like they, uh, they, re they regularly um, deploy, like at the end of the day or at the end of the week, and they click on that button and uh, deploy it. But there are some others may choose uh, different strategies that they want it, they want it to be um, more automatically um, and the only thing that's stopping them from deployment is a failed test. There's no that great take. Right. So this figure is, um, shows like different uh, difference between continuous deployment and continuous delivery. So the first line here, that the, the line up there is with this yellow one is continuous delivery and this yellow button here is yellow uh, rectangle here is meaning that button that we need that human intervention here. Like we need to click on that button. Okay. Um, right. So uh, in this course, like COM 1531, we use always data. It's free. Uh, you might already use that in your lab five. Um, in iteration three. Uh, we will also have deployment, and we will have uh, we will explain more details um, about like how we deploy in iteration three. You have some more practice on it, and you will learn, um, understand better. Okay, so now a very interesting topic here: DevOps. Um, this is a very, I think, very interesting and also um, important topic. It kind of because a lot of things that we talk about in the past, like uh, version control, uh, continuous integration, and today we talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment. They are all part of DevOps, so they are all uh, can, like a good pra good practices of DevOps. So uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to have a look at some other um, topics that we already talked about in this course before. So I got this slide. We will <laughs> dig a little bit more to it. So it's a good opportunity for us also to have a recap of uh, some other topics that we talked about earlier in this term. Okay, so tradition. So this is kind of, uh, we, we talk about full stack, like full stack developers get a very uh, good salary, very well paid, but DevOps um, skills is also uh, highly demanded in recent years. Like, um, and DevOps is have like a growing impact in many software companies. Um, you can have a look at Netflix, uh, Netflix is a very, very good example of DevOps. Uh, we will have a look at it together perhaps later. Okay, so this is the traditional way of um, software development. So we talk about most of, so we have already talked about most of it in this course, 
uh, we talk about design, right? We talk about development, we talk about testing, deployment today, we talk about it. And we also talk about maintenance uh, later today. And we will also talk about requirements next week. So we kind of covered uh, the full lexical like, of software development in this course. Um, so in traditionally, um, we, in software development, we follow this waterfall model. So we, we start with requirements, so understanding what the users need, like what we need to have uh, in our software, so the requirements of our software. And then we design it, we develop it, and we test it, we deploy it, and we maintain it. So this is the traditional way of software development life cycle. However, there's something that we might need want to we might want to uh, impro improve about waterfall model because it's quite um, time consuming. Like if we want to deploy it, some new version again, we need to start from requirement and uh, design, development, testing, and then deploy. So waterfall model follows that structure. It's not very flexible, and if we found on a later stage there are some mistakes, it's very expensive to fix. And there is usually a quite long time between software releases. So this traditional software uh, waterfall model is not have some drawbacks. And then um, you might have heard of the word agile. Have you? Yep. So what do you understand is agile? A philosophy of how to manage projects. Yeah. Good. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. So agile kind of have a. It's not different from waterfall model, which is sequential. It's kind of a loop. Like we have a lot of iterations. And in each iteration, we start from requirement to uh, deploy and then review. We get some feedback and we uh, improve it. Um, so we get feedback and we improve it. So we did not aim for a full software at the very beginning. We do something, for example, the prototypes, and then we get some feedback and we uh, make it better and better. So we split the full uh, software development process into sprints. Okay. So it's uh, a lot of interactions between the requirements and development and testing. Okay. Um, now we want to um, make it even faster, like the process have short, even shorter um, sprints, we can say that. Um, so this is how, like, where we introduce the DevOps. Okay. So what is DevOps? So DevOps is actually an extension of agile development environments that aims to enhance the process of software delivery as a whole. Okay. So we have uh, Dev here, development here. So we have code, build, test, everything. And then op is uh, like we release, we deploy, we operate, and we monitor the process. So it, a more um, comprehensive um, way. So DevOps is developed, uh, defined as recognition that working in silos doesn't work. Meaning that we have a group of softwares uh, working on development, a group of workers, uh, so a group of developers working on testing, another group working on requirements, another group working on maintenance. So this doesn't work. So we need more collaboration. So development and operations engineers, like everyone, need to work together and follow lean and agile uh, principles. And the most important part of here is that we need to deliver software in a rapid and continuous manner. So this is DevOps. Um, there are a couple of requirements for uh, DevOps. Um, so we need to have a new application design. It's about a mindset, like how we design software. It's um, not sequential, but more a lot of iterations. Um, the second one is leveraging automation, meaning that uh, we follow a lot of like CI, 
city pipelines um, that automate a lot of things. So it kind of helps us to um, be even faster in the process. And also it also involves a change in the culture. Um, so for the automation, there are a lot of tools that we can use. So in this course, we use the GitLab. And so the GitLab supports DevOps. So it's, by, many, uh, by saying that GitLab support DevOps, we mean that with GitLab, we can do version control, we can do CI and CD. Um, and there are also other tools that can help with different process in DevOps. So for example, we mentioned that AWS can help with deployment. Right? Um, and other tools can also help with testing um, and monitoring. And another thing is a change in the culture. So there's a saying that in Netflix, so Netflix is a pioneer in DevOps and it does very good in DevOps, but they do not really talk about DevOps in Netflix. So it's kind of a culture. So they collaborate a lot, they communicate a lot, um, they, automate thing, uh, they automate a lot of process and they uh, do things in uh, a lot of iterations and shorter sprints. So um, in some like traditional software companies, they may um, do not want to take that risk, like release a lot of, uh, do a lot of deployments every day or every week. Uh, they want to be safe, like uh, as long as I feel safe, I think everything's all right, and then I deploy and make it available for our users. But Netflix um, and some other companies, some uh, companies um, follow the default. Um, they kind of, uh, they try and they fail faster. So if there's anything wrong, they fail faster and then they solve it. So they do not, uh, like, they do not wait, like they have made a lot of changes, they may have, there may be a lot of things wrong and then it's very hard to change. So they, they are happy to take that risk and they, um, they solve small errors quickly. Um, Okay, so, um, for example, here we also have the saying that culture is the number one success factor in DevOps. Um, we have shared, we need to have shared responsibility, we need to have transparency and faster feedback. So this is kind of the key of DevOps. And the reason that we have CI/CD version control everything is also for, like for example, transparency and the faster feedback. So those are just tools, uh, good practices, but this is the principle. Okay, so a lot of modern software companies follow default practices. Um, yeah, collaboration and release faster. Right, okay, cool. So here are some concepts on default. This is just a summary of what we just mentioned. Um, committing, you can, you can see that you can see that reduce the time between committing a change to a system and the change being placed into a normal production while uh, ensuring good quality. So to practice that, work, we really need to trust our CI testing, like our testing suits, because we deploy everything automatically, uh, quickly. So we really need to have very good testing suits. So if every, anything failed during our testing, it will not be deployed automatically, right? It will stop us. So we really need to have a very good testing suits. And we need to trust our CI. Um, in DevOps, we also uh, emphasize the importance of uh, the available teams um, collaborate a lot, uh, communicate a lot, um, being transparent. Right. And also, uh, you might have noticed that uh, in some software companies, um, we may uh, have more roles like asking for skills not only in one specific area. Right, so they are asking us to have a full understanding of 
uh, software development lifecycle. Uh, so that is also important skill that you can use to for communication with other people and working as a team. Okay, cool. Now, um, other than requirements in the uh, software engineering lifecycle that we'll be talking about next week, the only component that we haven't talked about yet is the maintenance. Remembering in the software engineering lifecycle, right in the world for modern, the last one is maintenance. Um, we mentioned a little bit about maintenance when we talk about uh, design for maintainability, but we didn't really talk about maintenance. So maintenance is the stage after deployment. So after we deploy our software, after our users has uh, introduced our software, we need to uh, make sure that it's uh, working well. Right? So we need to catch if there's anything wrong. We need to understand the user's voice. So if there's any feedback from our users, we need to know it and um, we need to um, see how we can make it better and meet the user's need. So monitoring like our maintenance uh, have two purposes. So the first one is preserving user experience. So we need to monitor errors, if there's any warnings and also, if there's any other issues that affect performance or uptime or maybe also security issues as well. Um, so, um, I know that we are computer science or software engineering or other science or engineering students, so we may pay a lot of attention to coding, to programming. But there's an important fact that we must be aware is that our software, the reason that we have our software is to be used by our users. Right? So the purpose is that users can use our software and our software can achieve the user's goals, achieve the user's needs. Right? So make our user's life easier. No. So we develop software not for developers, but for our users. So everything that we work on in our software engineering, we need to make sure that we understand that. So the aim is to make our user's life easier. So here we are preserving our user's experience. Um, see if there's any issue when our user is using our software. And the second one is enhancing user experience. So making the user experience better. Okay. So, um, yeah, we didn't talk a lot about user experience in this course, but it's a very, very important part of software engineering. Um, user experience, uh, we uh, may need to use some tools uh, or some strategies. For example, we may talk with our users, right? like how you use our software, uh, what do you think of so our software, do, is there any challenges you have met like, when you use our software? Um, you may also, like for example, when you use uh, OneNote, like, I use OneNote a lot, and there's always a prompt asking me, like, how would I rate OneNote? And there are five stars. Right? So this is also another way of uh, monitoring user experience. Right? So we always need to have some feedback from our users. And um, this user experience, like how we improve user experience is not by um, we develop a think our users not this or that. It's really from what the users say and what the users do with our software. So they really come, so the user, like how we're monitoring um, the user experience is really coming from those users. So this is very important. Also for uh, like when we talk about conceptual modeling, uh, we are not modeling only for developers or our software uh, group. We are modeling to make sure that it models for our users. So we think from the user's point of view. Right. Okay, cool. Um, 
Now let's see an example. Um, okay, so um, if you want to practice uh, CD, like continuous uh, delivery or continuous deployment, uh, not within your project or lab, uh, you want to create up your own uh, project, it needs to be in our COP1531 GitLab folder again. So this is the same with uh, CI. Remembering that when we talk about CI, there's a runner. That we are using a runner. Uh, this is the same for CD as well. Okay, but you can also pay by yourself if you use a personal uh, repo on GitLab as well. But uh, 1531 uh, pays for you if you have your, uh, if you do practice in your projects. Um, here I just created an empty um, project here and the only thing that I have here is this index.html uh, readme file uh, but I added another uh, gitlab-ci yaml file. Um, remembering that when we do uh, CI pipeline well, we have uh, we had stages here uh, we have a couple of jobs here. So what we had before is that we have stage, uh, for example, check. Right. And we have a check job in the stage of check. I only have one hand here, I will not tap. I uh, will tap, okay. Um, check, check job. I will not tap. How does that say? But it's the same. Like we only add another job called deploy job, and in this stage, uh, deploy. It's exactly the same when we uh, practice with CI, and then we put uh, what we want to do in this script. Okay. Um, but here is only an example. What I'm doing here is. Uh, I copy my index file in my repo here to my CSE server and um, automatically deploy it. But I will uh, delete this line for now and I commit changes. You can see that I have a new deploy stage and when I go to my CICD pipeline, it's running and it's done, it's passed. So it's very, very similar uh, to when we talk about, uh, about CI. But we'll do more practice in of uh, iteration three. Okay, so you know more. And um, the lunch I just added here won't work. Um, the one that I had before here is this one. Because uh, to copy file to my CSC server, I need to put in my key. But I didn't put it here, so it won't work here. Okay, so this is um, very similar, like in practice. Um, but we talk a lot about theories today. Um, it's just trying to give you an introduction of a lot of concepts, but we'll do more practice in our labs and uh, projects. Um, now let's have a look at uh, how a CI/CD process in GitLab. So there are all, uh, many other, uh, some other platforms that support CI/CD, but we are using GitLab in this course. So let's have a look at. So this is kind of the workflow of CI/CD in GitLab specifically. Okay. So we talk about continuous integration. You can't see it. We work colors. Is it better? Or is it well because it's a image? It's an image. Okay. So um. What is here is continuous integration, so the CI, so it's first. If the CI path one passed, then we have two choices here. We can either choose continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So this is kind of the CI CD workflow in GitLab. Okay. 
So um, there are also some documents here in GitLab talking about how it supports DevOps. Um, I didn't have the link here, but uh, let me quickly have a look. No, I didn't have the link here, but you can have a look. Um, uh, GitLab also have a quite um, detailed description of how it supports DevOps. Let me search here. Git. GitLab DevOps. I'm looking for a table that um, not this one. Um, I can't find exactly that link, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, when GitLab mentioning how it supports DevOps, it actually says like how, it actually says like how it supports uh, version control, uh, continuous integration, and uh, oh, it's here. So here are the best practice uh, for DevOps. Uh, which includes version control, agile, CI/CD, and shift lab. So shift lab is not mentioned in this course, but you can see that uh, a lot of things we talk about in this course about projects, they are actually some best best practices of DevOps. Okay, so we talk a lot about this part here, and there's a now we kind of have an overview like they are all about DevOps. Okay, um, questions? Good question. Um, um, I'm not pretty sure. <laughs> um, I will have a look and you can also put that in the um, forum. Yeah, but we will talk about iteration three next week. Uh, originally, like in previous talk, we talk about iteration three during lectures. Um, in the first lecture in week eight. Uh, but in this term, we decide to give you that video earlier. So we are releasing iteration three back uh, this Saturday, and we will put that video together when we release that spec. So you can get access to um, more digital video recording of how iteration three is when we release it. So you can uh, get it earlier. Okay. <coughs> yep. Any questions so far? No? Good. Yep. Um, yeah, so there are also some further readings for you. Uh, it's all here. So we have some further readings for you. So most of them I have already mentioned in this lecture, but if you want to learn more details, you can have a look at the slide. Um, so I explained the difference between delivery and deployment, but you can have a look at uh, more detailed documentation of it and GitLab um, continuous integration I've already uh, shown you. Um, yeah, let's have a look at this one. Yeah, so a lot of concepts, theoretical things. Yeah, but they are very good, like for, um, on this website, there are some other things, like for example, we can also have continuous integration here. We have some tips, uh, how to get to continuous integration and the continuous delivery principles and more details. So these materials, like we can trust, but it's pretty good. 
Okay, so you can feel free to have a look at more details. Here, so it explains more details on like um, the difference between continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. So basically, continuous integration is the most basic part. So we always need to have it. And if we want to go a little bit further, then we can add uh, continuous delivery. Although that we also have still have some human interaction in it, we still need to click on that button. Uh, and then if we want to go further to continuously read, then we can uh, try continuous deployment. And so this is the relationship between these three. All right, otherwise that's all from me today. <laughs> a little bit always. So if you have any question, uh, we can stay here and discuss. Um, also, uh, we have a lot of help sessions this week. We do not have lab seven, so all everything like the help sessions and no labs like give you more time to work on your projects. Okay, so iteration two is pretty important. Right, so we give you more time for it, and then we will start uh, iteration three next week. And this year we do not have exams. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I hate exams too. So um, instead of exam, we add a uh, iteration four, a new iteration. Um, this so iteration four is different from iteration one, two, three. Uh, it's not group based. It's individual project, and there is no very very long steps. Um, we kind of give you more opportunities to do whatever you want, to try to practice the things that uh, you have learned in this course so far uh, in iteration four. So you can do what a lot of, you have a lot of freedom. Yep. Good question. So the question is uh, how much freedom you will have. Like, are we giving you a set of options, like optional directions, or you can do just whatever you want? So this is the question, right? So we give you a couple of directions. However, you can also have your own open-ended choice, right? Um, but we suggest that you talk with your tutor. Um, before you decide on your very own open-ended project direction. So make sure that you are on the right direction. Your question? Is it related to the project? Yes. Sorry, your question is? Is it really a project at all? Oh, is it relating to? Yes, it's building on top of your group project. You add something to your group project. Yeah. Yeah, question. Yes, so the question is whether iteration three is a group project. The answer is yes. Only iteration four is individual phase. Question. Uh, the question is, what, a, what is the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? Very, very similar. It's the only difference is that continuous um, delivery is human intervention, like when to deploy. You need to click on the button, and then it will be deployed. However, for continuous deployment, there's no such button. When all the tasks pass, and deploy automatically. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference. Cool. Okay. All right. And um, for CSE pipeline, like I know that um, a lot of you, uh, maybe not just in this uh, course, but um, like we tend to write the code for the features first, and then we start writing the CSE um, set. So it's 
not wrong, but we encourage you to have a good set of testing suit uh, early, as early as possible. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. So they are also. I've already covered all of it. So for example, automate everything, uh, version control, building quality with those testing. Um, and here they also mention like do the hardest part first and everyone is responsible. So this is important like everyone is responsible. We are not working in silos, but we are working as a team. Like the testing people, the development people, um, every people, like we are a team. So this is the culture of DevOps. That means release is never really done. Like I, as I mentioned in other lectures before, your software can never, never be perfect. Right, so if you wait for like when my software is perfect, I'm releasing it, I'm deploying uh, blowing users. So it's never gonna be perfect. So try to deploy uh, to your users as early as possible and get some feedback from users and then improve it, right? Otherwise, that's all. Uh, you can stay if you have any questions. We can have more discussions. Um, any questions from online? Yeah, question. Yeah. That one for iteration three and four. Um, Roughly, uh, we have two weeks for iteration three and two weeks for iteration four. So four and no more. Uh, four will be will do end of week eleven. I think I will double check now. I think we have it on our course website. It's available. Uh, In the course offline, you can see it here. Uh, major group project due Friday of week two, four, seven, and nine. Okay, so two weeks for iteration three. And then there will be the individual project iteration due Friday of week 11, so two weeks. Yep. <laughs> um, we removed something from iteration three from previous years, so it, the content is less. So we reduced the workload for iteration three from previous years. And we moved some of those reduced part to iteration four. Yeah, so some part of the original iteration three is not in iteration four. So we, uh, we move those parts that can be done individually to iteration four. Yep. Any suggestions, any feedback on it? Yep. It's a surprise. <laughs> um, you will see it very soon, this Saturday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. three, I think, will be a little bit easier than iteration two. Yeah. Uh, iteration two is the only one that uh, we give you three weeks. Iteration two. Okay, so I would suggest you to work on your project and contribute more to your project, get familiar with your project. Because iteration four will be individually. Okay. Yeah. What is the token <laughs> in iteration two? Uh, we got a question in the chat, like what is the token in, in iteration two? Please, please post this question on the forum. Um, 
And next week we'll be talking about requirements. So originally we have uh, iteration three talking in the lectures, but we'll move it uh, earlier and release this recording this Saturday. And we'll focus on requirements. So the only part on um, the uh, software engineering life cycle that is left so far that we haven't talked about yet, and this is requirement. It is a very, very interesting topic. I spent a lot of time during my PhD thesis working on these requirements. Um, like when I'm mentoring uh, senior year uh, projects, uh, many groups, they ignore requirements, make, which makes me very sad. Like requirements is super important. It really helps you define your scope and prioritize things. Okay, so we will be talking about requirements next week. And then what is left? Um, week nine, we'll talk about a little bit more about full stack, a little bit more about design and coding together. And week 10 will be more relaxed, working on our projects. Mm -hmm. Make good use of our forum. Again, again, I talk about this every time. Like make good use of the forum and the help sessions. And if you have any questions, please ask. Get some help from your teammates, from our tutors, and from our course. Okay. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. I'll see you next week. <laughs>